Hi, guys. Hey, Tanisha. Good morning, Harika. Good morning, Shreya. How are you all? Hello, very good. Good morning. Very well. Thank you so much for asking. How are you doing? No, no, I'm very well. Thank you for asking, Shreya. Thank you so much. That's so kind and polite of you. I was asked to be like this by a certain somebody. Hmm. Yes, yes, very well. Oh, can we see the slide, Tanisha? If you're comfortable sharing it right now on the screen. Absolutely. I mean, that's why I'm here. So very, very grateful. Sure. Thank you. Shreya, please give me a moment. I'm just going to connect my speaker as well, if that's okay for you. Absolutely. Um, Neharika, can we ensure Tanisha has the co-host rights? Thank you very much. Yes, because that's been disabled currently. Thank you for noticing, Shreya. Neha can't open her video. I've made ah, have you joined from the... No, no, I've made her the co-host letter dry now. Perfect. Anisha, which link have you used? I've used the link that was shared as a panelist. Perfect, perfect. It's happy. Guys, I quickly have shared an image. And I want to ask you guys how to go about it. So on my screen, it shows you are muted. No audio will be recorded. Record without audio or unmute myself. This is for who? For me, it's coming. So You okay. are muted. No audio record without. You are coming, Shreya. I will unmute myself. Yes, do it. It's fine. It's recording. Yeah, it's recording now. Let me mute and see if it comes again. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. It's all good. I found another album. It's uh, the cello only. Mm. And it's pretty nice. Can it's I just nice. uh, play it once? Of course. Give me a moment. Neha, hi, good morning. Didn't realize you were here. Hi. Welcome, welcome. Neha, you look very pretty, bright, and fresh. Thank you. Thank you. Fresh, I'm not. I'm looking at at least. Oh, the grays, man, the grays. I've written the grays somewhere. No, I'm just showing my grays. Oh, right. Not found. Ready to there. Connected to 1 plus 17. What do you think? It's giving me romantic feels. Yeah, I also think. Okay, wait, hold. Um, Tanisha, very sad it is. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. So we stick to yesterday's song on loop then? Yeah, I think so. Video play mat karna khali. I mean, wo ad play mat karna. So, Tanisha, do one thing. Since the music, uh, since the song is uh, chota na, start at 10.55, the music. Don't start it right now. Yeah, I think so. Someone's touching Neha's face. Neha is only touching. You know, what light are you using? Ring light. Oh my God. Send a picture of it after the session. Can you see this? This is where my phone is. Yeah. Thank you. It's looking like Matrix movie right now with the whole 
Yeah, Niharika. Yeah. Can you please, uh, send the attendee list. Uh, sorry, the attendee link for today. So I'm sending. I'm sending. Uh, to certain people. Thank you, Shreya. Right away. Thank you so much, Shreya. I'm truly Hi. honored. Why are you all talking like this? Because Niharika, like a star, has started recording the meeting. But that's okay. We'll edit that part, yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sharma asked me to behave myself, so that's the... why I have taken it a notch higher. Okay, Kaushik is here. I'll make him the co-host. Hi, Kaushik. Hi. Hello. How's it going? Hi, Kaushik. All good. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, just give me one second. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out if the mic is... So how's the audio? Can you hear me properly or? Yeah. All right, perfect. Kaushik, you can also check if you're able to uh, share your screen. Uh, all right, sure. Uh, let me just test out the whiteboard function. All right, sure. you can see me. Yeah, perfect. All right, cool, cool, cool. Thanks. All right, awesome. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for putting this event. Uh, I've I've heard like like a lot, a lot of good things from people. It's you guys putting the effort in. Yeah, great job. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So sweet. Kaushik, we begin at 11, so we'll have our cameras off before that. Uh, oh, you sure. just saw the slide, right? Um, so Tanisha will be sharing that slide on the screen, which has your name Tanisha. and just like a little guidelines. All right. At 11, Neha will introduce you, and that is when you come on the video. All right, perfect. Great. So uh, Kaushik, I'll basically um, give them an introduction about you, and then... Um, you know, you, you switch on your video, you come on, and then um, I will just take the participants through a few do's and don'ts um, in terms of, you know, raising their hand instead of typing incessantly, all of that. I'll, I'll just say that out aloud. And then uh, would you like to start with um, a poll uh, just to get an understanding of what uh, the audience uh, truly, uh, you know, the first question we have on the poll in terms of, does the organization they work at or the law school, right. they have, do they have a content marketing strategy in place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. That would be great. It's a written, documented sort of strategy. So let's start with the poll. Yeah. And then you can take on with just defining the entire university, why it's important to have a strategy in place. And all, of that. all right. Awesome. All right. Uh, so just curious, how did the event go yesterday? Pretty good. We had about 25 participants. Okay. 23, 24 participants, yeah, at oh. all times. Um, pretty interactive. Uh, so they kept asking questions in the Q&A section or they would raise their hand and then post their um, questions on in the chat box. Uh, okay. So it was very, very interactive, which was great. All right. Awesome. That's lovely. Since it was LinkedIn, we could not, we uh, we weren't allowed to uh, record the session. Yours, of course, like I told you, uh, we'll, we'll record it. Um, we may not use the entire recording to post somewhere, but maybe snippets from the from the chat could be used uh, on the social media platform just to, you know, create interest. And then if they want the link, then we can probably send it, send them the link. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. That works, right? Uh, from like a perspective of like a consent for using it, uh, yeah, you can use it for any purposes. There's no restriction on that. That's very kind of you, Caustic. <laughs> Wait, uh, so I'm curious, why aren't you uh, like uh, doing the LinkedIn session? Is it like 
you want more people contacting you or yeah. so linkedin has an internal policy okay. uh, that you are not allowed to record these sessions because uh, in the past there has been there have been cases of misuse especially with potential clients because linkedin has a paid solution also right which is oh, the right. LinkedIn challenge solution uh which is a very big piece of where revenue comes from so what oh, is gotcha. a lot of potential clients actually you know call you in to do the session and then they sort of don't buy anything and that's kind of annoyed managers in the past so that's when they sort of uh, a few years ago they sort of released this policy uh through their internal popcom that we're not going to be allowing any recording so in fact they're very particular about what is the session looking like uh, is it you know uh, is it going to, where is it going to be cast so they ask us a lot of questions beforehand hmm. it's just part of their corporate yeah. policy now all right gotcha Hey, sorry. Uh, do you mind if I use like the whiteboard once? Because I've never actually typed anything there. I just want to test it. I don't want to do it during the call. Please do that. Please, do. please, please. Uh, yeah, sure. Right. I'll look something like this. Oh, cool. It's pretty easy. Uh. Hi Sonam. Sonam has joined. Neharika, it didn't work, huh? Waiting list. Yeah. Oh, also, like, so I, I'm looking at the Zoom screen and there's like Q&A, polls and raise hand, all these options. Is this like <laughs> something new that LinkedIn's offering? Because I've never seen it on like a regular Zoom call before. So this is uh, basically the webinar version of, uh, of Zoom. It's a paid subscription, so you have to buy it. Uh, we wanted to keep this on because one, of course, because we intend to run polls. Um, the Q&A section is just, uh, you know, it helps us navigate it better. So when a person types in uh, their question in the Q&A section, you can actually just, um, you know, basically, um, view it online if the question has been answered or not so you can actually say answered live and then it goes away otherwise it keeps uh you know blinking and coming oh on. okay so like a moderator can like have a look at it and exactly. Exactly. Okay. are you like satisfied with like the zoom this webinar platform or are other platforms better in your opinion so honestly, we haven't uh, we haven't really tried too many. So when we did the unsuited um, um, seasons, I think we were uh, using Zoom. So uh, we had some kind of comfort with this with this platform. We have very briefly used Microsoft Teams, but given that we've not used it very frequently, I think just the usability of it is not does not come very naturally to us. So didn't want to take a take a chance on trying anything new, and so just you know uh, when do we gotcha. is there uh, is there are there any other uh, sort of platforms that you would recommend 
Oh, no, sorry, not really. I never ran polls. And yeah, and, uh, since the call's not officially started, yeah, I fucking hate teams. It, it's pretty bad. So, okay. Uh, I've, I've used teams in the past for like, uh, like internal meetings. Uh, I worked at the previous law firm. Um, it, it, was, it was really bad, like I said. So I was curious about like the Zoom. Okay, okay. Where were you, um, which firms did you um, work with, Kaushik, in the past? Oh, so I only work with one firm. Uh, it was in Korea. Uh, it was called ah, okay. Pi IP Law. It was in, um, well, it's an IP law firm. I Patents and trademarks. So I worked as like a digital marketing manager off, right off college. It's pretty interesting, actually. Okay, so I think Tanisha will start music anytime now. And we've got attendees joining, so um, I'll just put. Oh, uh, so mute. I'll, I'll I'll mute myself. Just tell yes. me when to like unmute yes. and start the video. Yes, I, I'll once I introduce you, that's when you come on video and unmute yourself.
Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to day two of the DGM Colloquy. The Colloquy is a forum for the legal community to have engaging and strategic conversations about matters that impact the practice of law. Um, allow me to welcome our uh, guest speaker for today, uh, Kaushik Prakash. Uh, Kaushik is the director of Value Legal Marketing, a marketing agency that specializes in SEO, content marketing, and paid ads for small and mid-sized law firms. In this post-new COVID world, um, Kaushik is helping law firms navigate the digital space and generate high quality leads through their content marketing. Welcome, Kaushik. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh. It's lovely to be here. Um, welcome um, to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you for logging in. Uh, Anupam, Mitali, uh, Samaira, Shubhi, uh, Sonam, thank you so much for joining. Um, some quick pointers to bear in mind and to ensure that, that we get most of uh, most out of the session. Uh, since the session is in a webinar format, your cameras and microphones will be switched off. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions at the end of the session or during the session. Uh, just click on the raise your hand icon and um, you know we will probably give you an option to unmute yourself, to engage with the speaker directly and ask your question. Alternatively, you can um, share your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, we encourage you to uh, participate in the interactive polls during the session. Um, okay, on that note, uh, Kaushik, should we begin with, uh, you know, our first poll there? Um, and um, if we can just make that live, TTM team, there you go. For 20 seconds to complete the poll and then Kaushik can have the floor. Sure. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, it's, it's good. I'm, I'm excited for the questions, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're pretty excited ourselves to just find out the entire universe of content marketing. It's just, uh, there's so much uh, to it. It's been talked about. We loosely throw a few terms here and there, and, uh, you know, on strategy and content marketing and you know, how important it is. Um, about time we had an expert talk to us about it. Okay, we've got about um, six people who answered that question out of the 11. I would encourage everyone to actually just um, key in your answers. But most people, and we have a mix of uh, uh, you know people from law firms, partners at law firms, we've got uh, people who are in the business development, uh, knowledge management sort of roles, and we've got students. So uh, yeah, okay, we've ended the poll now. Kaushik, all yours. Uh, why don't you begin with just defining the entire universe of content marketing for us? Is it just the articles that we write, uh, and especially in the legal context, right? So is it the articles? Is it the newsletters we send out? Um, is it the LinkedIn posts we create? Um, yeah, all yours. All right. So I actually found a really good definition to say what content marketing actually is. So I'm going to read it off here. So content marketing is a strategic marketing approach to focus on creating and distributing valuable, relevant, and consistent content to attract and retain a clearly defined audience. So with that in mind, yes. Uh, so law firms currently publish a lot of articles. They do, they share the articles on LinkedIn as a post. So, you know, they try to push it out as like uh, email newsletters. Uh, that's a great start, but it needs to be something more than, all right, look, just push out content to my audience and expect 
new clients to come in and give me cases. I think that's a very, I don't want to offend the audience here, but it's a very shallow approach. It needs to be something way more structured, rigid, so that they can go, hey, look, I, uh, I think so. We'll, I think we'll be talking about ROI on your content marketing strategy eventually. But, it, uh, but right now, the ROI on content marketing strategy is I put X amount of dollars in, what money am I getting out, right? And I think it's, it's way too broad and it's not targeted. And that's why most content marketing strategies don't work because they don't have, you need to have short term and long term goals to see, okay, look, I've hit all the short term goals. And am I, you know, going towards something long term? So that should be the ideal goal for law firms because, like I said, we could talk about like KPIs. Do you need to have like a content calendar and all these like smaller, finer details? But on a macroscopic level, it should be create consistent content and know where your audience are and how you can distribute it properly instead of create a piece of content that you don't know if your audience is going to read and just blast it to your email newsletter. So you're like, Hey, most law firms, I think have like a newsletter, which is great. A oh, great start, by the way, I'm not going to just like come at, come here and say, Oh, you're doing this bad. You're doing this good. I'm going to give you the both ends of it so that you know how to approach this space. So most of them, they just send out email blasts, right? It's like, Oh, I don't know. So they signed up to my newsletter. So I, I'm sure they want to know everything I do in my firm. So that is not content marketing strategy. That is kind of hoping hope is not a strategy. It's more of, all right, I'll do something and I hope something happens. That's not how it should be. You should have shorter goals and like leading to microscopic goals. That's what I would do if I worked at a law firm right now. Correct, correct. Um, I think, so, I mean, is it is it fair to say that, you know, newsletters are a great way of, of reaching out to pertinent audience and the intent behind doing the newsletter has to be that you want your audiences to know what's happening. Um, for instance, if you're doing regulatory updates on a on a regular basis. Uh, you want your audience to know what's happening on the regulatory side and your audience could be corporates that you've been dealing with. If the intent is that I will send out the newsletter and I will get two matters um, after this, I think it's it's most likely to fail because the intent has to be very, very clear that uh, you know, you're doing this because you want your content to reach your audience uh -huh. and also because you believe that your content is very good, it's crisp, it's well uh, written and it also sort of uh, probably defines the or, or uh, breaks down the regulatory update in the manner that it is palatable by all, right? It's not mm -hmm. just for fellow lawyers. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, I think this is, uh, we're tackling multiple topics here at the same time. So first I want to go over, so uh, I think, I post a lot on LinkedIn, so for the attendees who don't know, I post six days a week. And if you see my posts, I think there's a consistent theme of me constantly bashing legal updates. Uh, it, it's more of me saying, hey, look, it's you shouldn't be doing that. And some of the posts are why you shouldn't be doing it. So I just want to like give you like a brief summary of why legal updates are good and bad when it comes to your content marketing strategy. So most firms think, when they think content, so they think, all right, so X, Y, Z changes in the law happened. So I have to let my readers, my audience and my clients know that change happened. All right, great start. That is a really good approach. But what you shouldn't do is have legal updates as your only content marketing strategy. Because I work with so many law firms where they put the legal update on the website, on their blog section, and they think, all right, I'm done for content for like the next two weeks, which is a bad approach to have because uh, we'll also be talking about SEO here. Uh, the way people search content is they don't search for legal updates. They search for something in that category. So they don't go, oh, I want to know what X, Y, Z changes in the law happens. And honestly, they don't care about what that changes. They want to know the results of what, how it's going to affect them. So if you could like put it that way, that is a 
great way to like alter your content marketing strategy a bit rather than going, oh, in section, this thing, article, blah, 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 this change happened. Uh, if I read that article, like, so let's say I was turned into a client and I looked at a law firm publishing that type of content, I'm going to be, all right, I don't know what that changes. And frankly, I'm not a lawyer or a, any in the legal industry other than as a marketer. I want to know how it affects me. So if you could add your two cents and say, hey, look, so this happened, so this is how it's going to affect you, and this is how you should navigate it. If, so I think this extra personalization goes a long way. So, okay, that's my uh, stance on <laughs> legal updates. And when it comes to distributing it on your newsletter, I think a newsletter is one of the best ways to nurture leads because so they took the initiative to like sign up to your newsletter, right? So you in, a, in marketing, we call it going from a cold lead to a warm lead because they have some interest in what you have to offer and they're interested basically. And you may, a newsletter is a platform where you can nurture your leads. And in a place of nurturing, if you were to just blast out emails to like all 3000 people without having a targeted email list. So one could be, one could have signed up for your articles. Others could have just signed up for your newsletters. Oh, sorry, legal updates. Others just want to know what what's happening with your firm. They could be your friends. So I think it's important to segment your list before blasting it out to like, let's say you had 3000 people in your newsletter instead of saying, Hey, look, I did something in my firm. So all 3000 people have to know it. That's so in a place of nurturing, if so some people find it spammy and they'll be like, all right, I no longer like what they have to offer. So I'm going to out, opt out of the email list. So I think you should like categorize your email list so that it's a, like, you have to understand it's, it's a place for nurturing your leads who will potentially turn into cases if you keep putting up good content. Got it. And, and could you talk about the advantages of, of content marketing? Um, and, and when I say content marketing, I include everything. So articles, newsletters, legal updates, LinkedIn, uh, if, if you're looking at personal content, using content marketing for personal branding as well. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think are the advantages of, of uh, this? All right. So simply put, uh, content marketing on a surface level, it helps you build your brand. So for me like so i'm living example that because i'm here personal branding works because neha contacted me via linkedin so we connected and she told me about this seminar and i was interested so so she saw what i had to offer and she's been following my posts for a while and so i'm living proof to see that content marketing works and you can actually get speaking events you can get recognition and even clients from it so yeah, it helps you build your brand. And one thing I've noticed when it comes to law firms is trust is a big thing because when it comes to something legal, it's often very personal because if you're, I'm going to use the example of it's more BDC. So let's say you are a family lawyer or a personal injury immigration so these are issues that your clients, it's very personal because let's say someone had an accident and they want to come to you. So it's, there's this criteria, there's this, like, there's this invisible barrier and you have to like, like, you know, shorten the distance by developing trust and building trust at the same time and through your content. So I, I like to think that, so familiarity breeds awareness. So the more someone's familiar about what you do. So it, so like if someone sees you posting articles consistently and know that you're providing valuable, good information for free, they're automatically subconsciously, they're more likely to trust you because they know that, all right, their intention is not to like, it's not very salesy. It's not like, Hey, look, buy me, come to me, come to me. It's not like pushing, right? It's more, all right, this guy is genuine and he wants to help me. So yeah, I think it really, for from a law firm perspective, it helps build trust and at the same time, credibility. So a lot of law firms, uh, I don't think they, um, like the established one, they don't, they do not struggle with credibility because they're getting, currently getting clients from referrals. So they have like really good reviews uh, and, you know, it's just like good word of mouth, but let's say you're an up and coming firm 
and you want to stand out, let's say your competition or you want to, so like in a, you're in this industry where there's a lot of big fish, right? And you're a small fish in a big pond. So I think content marketing really helps you set yourself apart because oftentimes these big law firms, they put out content, but it's not great. It's more like, hey, look, we did this event. We hosted this thing. We hosted that thing. It's not really like giving 100% giving value. So I think from uh, you could set yourself apart that way. So basically building um, brand awareness, creating trust, and also, uh, you know, also in some way reiterating your credibility, I, if, if we were to put it that way, um, brand trust and credibility, that, that is right. uh, what I understand. And from an, uh, in, so I've noticed with like a lot of Indian firms, it's from an intrinsic point of view, uh, one good thing is by putting out good content and building your brand, I think it makes it so much easier easier to hire great talent yeah. because I think and I've noticed that one conversation I have with law firms is they struggle with getting good talent so all of them want to work for you know the the big four and which is which is great but at the same time there are other wonderful small and mid-sized firms and there's equally good opportunity to learn and grow and I think if you want to hire the right talent so putting effort into your branding and content marketing will help you get that talent. Um, and and um, can you also talk about the different types or mediums of content marketing? So of course, article writing is one. And of course, I'm, I'm certain you've seen law firm content and law firm pages in India where um, at least two to three uh, pages of uh, updates or articles are always put out, right? And it's put out uh, it's it's basically an upload feature on LinkedIn. They just upload it, and that's it. Like they want you to read that. Uh, there is no snippet written. There is no image used. Um, none of that actually uh, happens, and none of that is given any importance. Uh, can you talk about talk about that a little? All right. I, I think I live by this quote. So I say, in this world of automation, personalize because everything in this world is automated. It's so I used to, I'm guilty of doing it. I'm going to say it uh, out loud because I'll write a piece of odd article. I'd be too lazy to upload it. I'll be like, Oh, which software can I use to like, you know, upload it? I don't want to do it manually, which uh, I, I see is understandable, but people is so everything is so automated. People want personalized stuff. It could be content. It could be messages. If, if they know it's personalized, you, they know that you went that extra step to actually care about your audience, your readers, and well, potential clients who could give you cases. Okay, so when it comes to content, so law firms put out, like you said, put out articles. So they take the article and they post it on the, they, they post the exact same thing on the LinkedIn page and the lawyers and others just reshare that post, right? It's, and one thing is you have to know that is these platforms, be it, I'm going to use LinkedIn as an example here. So if you reshare content, uh, it's, fr it's from an algorithm perspective that content that's reshared doesn't do well. So like one of the things, so if you make an original post, uh, you could reach like 500 people. But if you just reshare it, it could only reach 50 people. So LinkedIn works in such a way that so they want new content that your audience will find engaging. And the algorithm is smart enough to know that if you share content, that just doesn't happen. So it needs to be very specific and tailored. So I think personalize your content. It's good that I think you're coming with the right intentions of, okay, look, I want my like readers on LinkedIn to, you know, see my content, but the way you're approaching it is not the right one. So instead of just resharing it, why don't you make a separate post? Use the image, give your two cents, and make your own post. I think your readers and and in uh, and the networking in India is crazy. Like it's people actually want like like when I look at content like outside India, it's more of all right, okay, this guy's posting content, whatever. But in India, they're like, oh wow, you. I would love to hear your two cents and there's this need for personalization and they want good content, but it's not available because 
they know that law firms just share content. And I think if you go that extra step to personalize it, you can stand out so much better than let's say your competition or if you try to build your brand, it's a good way to set yourself apart. Correct, correct. So why don't why don't we uh, we have we have a poll question? Why don't we get the audience to answer? Uh, what type of content does your organization? And in the case of law students, uh, what type of content does your law school um, actually generate? So if the participants could could key in their answers, that'll be great. There you go. Oh, we got some good answers here. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought it was going to be articles, videos, reshare posts on LinkedIn. So uh, <laughs> well, we're seeing like different lines go here. So that's great. Okay. So there we have it. I think um, blog articles, uh, newsletters, and then infographs. So, mm -hmm. and we have videos as well. So that's great. All right, that's awesome. Uh, I think the one person that said infographics is gonna, if you work at a law firm, I think you're miles ahead of everyone in the content marketing space. And I think if you keep at it, you'll see wonderful results because. Like I said, if there's like a piece of legal update and instead of taking like, I don't know, seven minutes to read the entire article, it's more likely that people just want to skim and get what's going on over there. But if you were to put it as an infographic in a single image and people can just look at it. So your mission is achieved in less than 15 seconds for your readers. And I think they appreciate you saving time. So yeah, okay, that's a great one, actually blog articles and videos as well. I think videos are, uh, I wanna say it's underrated, but the production is pretty difficult. And, but yeah, it's a good, I think all three are necessary. It's like, I'd also, I, I wish I'd seen like more podcasts on it because I think po there's a huge demand for podcasts and there's not enough supply of it. So I would like to see more podcasts on that list eventually. Huge. In fact, I completely agree with you. And you run one, right? Uh, you have one with your partner as well. Yeah. So uh, I have, oh, it's, a, it's, an un, it's an unsolicited publicity for the podcast here. It's okay. <laughs> but I'm going to take this opportunity. So I, I have the Legal Two Cents podcast. So I have a business partner. His name's Ethan. I think if you're connected on LinkedIn, you'll see the podcast cover. He's the ginger fella in the podcast. So yeah, uh, so yeah, basically we started this podcast because we realized that there are podcasts in this industry, but it's long, it's like boring. So it's just, if you, if you look at like our podcast, it's just like two buddies, like we grab a couple of drinks and and we just chat it out. Like sometimes we have differing opinions. Sometimes we like argue about it. So yeah, thing it's it's a like I said, it's a great way for us to stand out in the legal marketing industry. Right. In fact, we uh, I'll, I'll take the liberty to say this. So so even at the at the gray matter, we have uh, recommended uh, a few clients to uh, start a podcast and make it short, make it interesting, um, and. You know, even though the even though the senior partnership was actually geared up, we saw that a lot of uh, the associate level people were very averse to it, and it, it was shocking for us because uh, you know, at that at that level, you feel like there will be more openness to different formats, and uh, we saw that there was actually um, a bit of resistance. So. I think um, it's not always that, uh, you know, we, we constantly tend to believe that, the you know, it's very difficult to convince the partnership and, you know, uh, and then once they are convinced, it trickles down. But it's actually, we found it difficult to convince the, you know, the associates and uh, the partnership was pretty convinced. So, yeah, it, it could be, it could be either way. <laughs> okay. But I think it's also like, 
uh, how do I put it? So the partners know that once the episode is done, they're done, but the rest of the work gets passed on to the associate. I think that's why you might see a bit of resistance because they damn well know that, all right, this guy is going to do one thing and it's a one-time thing. I'll have to like take over eventually. <laughs> Totally. Uh, so we have a couple of questions here. Um, Samira is asking, uh, personalization, um, personalizing content can be time consuming. So any tips on how to do that? And uh, all right, let's, uh, let's answer uh, that first, uh, the question first. So like I said, personalization is time consuming. So that's why not a lot of people do it. And that's why there's a huge demand for it. And that's why if you do it, you set yourself apart. So uh, I, 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 for, I hated it when I initially did it because when I like started my business, I had to, you know, personalize. I still, I, when it comes to content personalization, I still do it, but I had to reach out to like people, like I had to send like video messages and it was like so time consuming, but I think it's worth it because I've had messages like, from people thanking me for sending a video message because they're so starved of good personalization. They're like, oh my God, thank you for sending me a message pitching your SEO services. And I'm like, okay, usually it's either, all right, they block you, they tell you to, you know, piss off and stuff like that. But here they thank me and they wanted to set up a call. Okay. So yeah, uh, it is time consuming, but I want to <laughs> say it's definitely worth it. It is 100% worth it. And all right, the next question says, does anyone listen to lawyer podcasts, especially prospective clients? How do I target it skillfully? Um, when it comes to purely listening to an entire episode, I want to say no, they don't completely listen to the entire podcast. But the intention is to know that you're targeting all three mediums. So some people like to read. Uh, I, okay, I can't swear here. So I hate reading uh, because it's some people love it. Uh, some people hate it. I personally love videos and like some people said that they do three people said they, they do videos. And if I had any needs for legal services, I would rather go to your YouTube channel than read your blog article. And at the same time, some people love podcasts, so it can be time consuming and the results. So you're, ROI on your podcast initially will be super low, but from a branding perspective, long-term, it goes a long way. I hope that answered your question. Uh, we have a third one. It says, can you give us an example of creating a target, um, target segment list? How often should one ideally send out newsletters without making it look like you're spamming? All right, uh, just give me one second. Let me get some water. Uh, that's a great question. I want to say that uh, for frequency, I think you have to, I want to say, um, I want to give like a vague answer here. It's, it's, it depends on your effort, honestly. So if you feel like, uh, I'm not sure if you're a, like a partner or a marketer at that, at the firm. And so I'm going to base it up. I'm going to give answers for all three. So if you're a partner and you're currently writing content, uh, depends on how not busy you are. You know, but I know lawyers are always busy, but it depends on how much time you can invest in it. Because writing a really good piece of content takes anywhere between seven to eight hours when I worked at my previous law firm. And it's oftentimes it'll take months to write it. So ideally, it could. I want to say start with once a month. If you can stick to it and stay consistently put once a month, do it twice a month. And if you, if you have trouble sticking to it, do not like you need a schedule where you can stick to it consistently. That's the key here. It's not about how many times my clients say it. It's about what you can do it. Or if you have the financial resources, you can outsource it. Or if you have like a full BD team with the content writers, um, you can make them do it twice a month and see how the feedback is and push it to three times a month. So that's a really good schedule. And in terms of segmenting your list, so uh, if you have multiple practice areas and you're in multiple industries, that's like the basic segments. 
But after that, you have to segment it into content types. So some people just want to know more about your articles. Like they want to know what the latest trends are. And some people just want to know legal updates. So if you're a B2B law firm and you work with a lot of lawyers and they are aware of X, Y, Z changes in the law happen, but you can like go the extra step. And like I said, give your two cents on how it will affect the industry. Some people just want that type of content. And some people, they could be your friends. There's probably few loose noters. They want to know what's going on with the firm. So you got a new, you hired someone new. Sure. Like send it to them. They want to know they, they're rooting for you. They're happy for you. So showcase it to that. And I think that's a good way on a, like going step two segmenting. And hopefully that answered your question. And if you have any follow-up questions, please do ask me that. And can you name a firm who's done uh, the podcast bit well? Is, is in your experience, do you know of a firm? It doesn't have to be an Indian firm. Um, do you know of a firm who's done it well? Uh, so there's a lot of personal injury uh, firms. Uh, it's called okay. One is called Tor Homan. Uh, it's a Chicago-based firm. And I'm pretty good friends with the marketing manager. Um, so yeah, so they did a podcast and initially here it was the other way around. So they had a BD team and the lawyers were like, oh man, it's a podcast. They weren't worth it. We don't know if it's not going to work out, but they did it. And surprisingly, a lot of people said it's more of, oh, you said something in the podcast that resonated with me. So it's more of, I like that you're putting on podcasts and it says that you go the extra step to, to, you know, educate your clients. It's once again, it all goes with your branding. It's your clients have to feel that trust, the credibility. And if you're on different channels, it's easy to do that. So that's why I insist on law firms and lawyers starting their own podcasts. It could be super technical. Uh, so that's a different matter, but on a surface level, it's like, are they putting that effort to go that extra step so that, you know, do they actually care? So that's the question that your clients want to answer. Yep. Okay, uh, why don't we now uh, try and understand uh, SEO? Uh, it's a word that, again, is thrown around on LinkedIn very frequently. Um, the marketing and BD teams at law firms uh, throw that word at lawyers very, very frequently. Um, so why don't we try and understand the, the SEO side? We have a poll on that. Let's just try and run the poll first. There you go, participants, if you could just key in your answers. I think the surface level question has to be, do you know what SEO is? <laughs> All right, there's the realistic answer I was expecting. So that's great. Okay. Why don't you take that on? Um, so why don't you tell uh -huh. us what SEO means uh, and how is it actually relevant for firms and also for individuals? All right, okay. SEO, so I want to start by saying how SEO works and how is it different from other channels. So I'm aware that in India, you cannot run, you cannot advertise or solicit your services, legal okay. services, because it's against the rules. And so, I'm, so how ads work is, I know you can't run ads, but just to set a frame. So how ads work is, so let's say you're on Facebook, you're scrolling, your Instagram, you're scrolling, and an ad pops out. So you're stopping someone's day to show your ad. So they could just easily scroll past it or get annoyed by it. But SEO is, it's, we call it user intent. So someone is literally searching something into Google and they want answers. And that's why SEO is great because ads, you go to people and say, hey, look, pick me. SEO is more of them coming to you and when they do that, automatically the quality of the leads is like higher because all you have to do is be at the right place at the right time kind of way. So if they're searching for, well, let's take uh, best lawyers in Mumbai. So you, if your website is optimized for those keywords, best lawyers in Mumbai, best law firms in Mumbai, and you show up when they search something, automatically the chances you 
you increase the you increase the chance of them contacting you. I think that's why SEO is really important. Um, so, is there like anything specific you want to know about SEO, or is it more like how, like you need to optimize for SEO stuff like that? I think I think how to optimize for SEO. I think um, I think the audience uh, probably. So I think most of them are not aware of what SEO can do. So um, anecdotes, stories, um, if that format. Oh, sure. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So I so I started working with this um, Australian firm. Unfortunately, I don't have Indian law firm clients, so I don't have an Indian example. So I get that. Sorry about that. But so I, I started working with this Australian law firm, and they were basically like, they weren't aware of what SEO does. So in Australia, you can run paid advertisements because it's legal there. So they were running ads and they were getting like, they were paying a lot of money because they were in the personal injury industry and it's one of the most competitive ones. So they said, hey, look, we don't want to spend like $10,000 every month just to get 10,000 people to our website. We want something which is more organic. And so the main problems they were struggling with is they were getting poor leads from their Google ads. So they said, hey, Kaushik, I need more like high quality people to view my content. And SEO can help you do that. And SEO can consistently bring you like visitors to your website who will potentially turn into clients. Because if, so if you run ads and if you stop running ads, everything stops. SEO doesn't work that way. So once you write a piece of content, and like five, six years later, it could still generate you leads. It could still get people to your website. That's why SEO is really amazing. So what we did for them was, so their website was, their website was pretty good. So, but they had, didn't have any content optimized for SEO. They wanted like more inquiries. They wanted higher quality leads. And honestly, they were just tired of paying thousands of dollars every month just to get people to their website. So what we did was we optimized their content for SEO. I know that's like a term thrown around, but I'll get into the specifics for a bit. So their web pages, so like their practice area pages, their lawyer profiles. So that's something that's often overlooked by law firms. So we optimized that for what people were searching. So let's say if someone was searching personal injury lawyer near me, so we were going for the terms personal injury lawyer or things related to personal injury in that space so that when someone searched it, their website would show up. And I think you have to understand that, like, uh, Lena, let me ask you. So when you search something on Google, right? When was the last time you went to the second page of the search results? Uh, I don't remember. That's the answer. That's the answer right there. So if your website, if your law firm website right now is on the fifth page of Google, they're not going to find you. It's as simple as that. I think the only time I went to the second page of Google was when I wanted to find homework answers and I was super desperate. So I think that was the only time I went to like the Google second page results. So, and I studied engineering and, you know, I was a desperate engineering student. I wanted answers so bad. So that was the only time I went to the second page of Google search results. So you have to realize that. So if you want organic traffic, you have to be on the first page of Google search results when someone searches something related to your industry, because the top, the first link gets 33% 33% of the clicks, second gets 20, third gets 15, fourth gets 10. And so the top 10 results are the only ones that get clicks. If you go to the second page of the results, it's less than 0.5%. So imagine this, right? Someone's just searching something about your industry and you happen to be on the first page of Google. You don't have to do anything. It's just people coming to your website, they're figuring out what to do and they're just contacting you. So that's like easy money in a way. So yeah, I think that's how, that's what we did for the Australian firm. And SEO takes a while. I think that's something uh, like, like I have to convince partners to understand because it's not like, hey, look, I posted this piece of article once, where are my leads? I paid you X amount of dollars this month. Where are my leads? It's something that takes, it's like building your brand, right? It takes a lot of time to build your brand. 
So similarly, SEO takes time, but at the end, you get like people coming to your website consistently and it's worth it. Correct, correct. And, and um, is it also possible to, um, you know, basically um, get or divert traffic to your LinkedIn page and your website? Is, is that a possibility? Um, we, have a, we have a poll question relating to that as well. Uh, why don't we run that first and then sure. we'll hear your answer. So uh, I want to explain backlink to your website is so when you write a piece of content on or share a piece of article on LinkedIn, it does it link to your website. That's what backlinking means. Hmm. And uh, if, if any of the topics I'm talking is uh, too technical, please let me know in the Q&A and I can try to explain it again. Okay. So there's your answer. Um, don't know. Okay. Uh, mostly, but uh, yes and no is a. And I, I think so. I want to like deviate a bit and say, so I, I, so I post a lot of content on LinkedIn. It's wonderful, but just posting content on LinkedIn is, I think it's a good and a bad idea. Good idea because there's a lot of professionals there and they see your content, but bad idea because you cannot capture any of the traffic that you get on LinkedIn. Because if it's your website, you can you can take you can make people take action. So you can get them to sign up to your newsletter, which is where you nurture leads. It's a great way. But on LinkedIn, you cannot do that. So there is no way to. You can put your hey, sign up to my link like newsletter box on LinkedIn. But besides that, it's a tough way to like capture the traffic. So LinkedIn is good and bad. Yeah, I think you need a mix of both. That's the honest answer here. Right. I think, I think also maybe, uh, you know, even when we are writing newsletters, right, um, what we've seen firms do is uh, when they create a newsletter, they send it out to the entire client base. And then um, they also upload that entire document on LinkedIn and also uh, upload uh, the same thing on their website. So uh, I think the important uh, takeaway would be to... Um, Create a snippet for LinkedIn uh, as to what you're writing about. Maybe use an image, and uh, actually, uh, you know, the image or the snippet has to be interesting enough for them to click on the link that's on your website. That's how you backlink. Uh, you know, um, the, if even if you're creating just one piece of content, it's at least backlinked to your website, and people actually end up going there. So, focus on what you're putting out there as an appetizer. So that people are actually, um, you know, sort of compelled to uh, check out the entire menu for main course. Right. Just, you know, using a food yeah, analogy. I think, uh, like, so now I think we're moving more into content distribution. So I think this is something people do pretty good, but I want to talk a bit more. So different people consume content differently on different platforms. So on your website, articles do really good because it's that's how it works, right? And Google appreciates from an SEO perspective, Google likes it when you have a 2,000, 3,000 word article. It's just how the algorithm works. So when it comes to your website, articles are great. So, but let's say you're also going on Instagram. So you have to tailor your content to the platform. You can't just, upload the article on Instagram, you have to optimize the content. So Instagram is very image oriented. So you have to make the image enticing. You want people to, you know, engage with the image. So that's how you should approach that platform. But when it comes to LinkedIn, it could be text format. It could be an image with like a catchy headline. So, or it could be a snippet, but yeah, I think, you have to tailor your content to how the platform consumes it. Otherwise you can think, Oh, I want to stand out and not do that. But that, unfortunately the algorithm will penalize you for that. Okay. And, and um, so we have a couple of questions on that. I'm a new law firm. What is my best way to optimize SEO? And should I be paying for SEO? 
Okay. Uh, all right, that's a great question, and I love answering this. So one thing you have to do before you even think of SEO is, do you have a great website? So I don't mean like, oh, is it will my clients like it when they click on my website? It's more of when they come on come to my website, do they have all the questions answered? So I think that's the first question you have to ask. So make out like an FAQ of like 20 questions of what they ask and write articles or just make an FAQ about it. And so that's number, that's number one. And what is the best way to optimize it? Uh, so I will talk a bit more about the entire process that goes behind, you know, putting out content and how I optimize a content for SEO uh, for a law firm. So I will answer that after these questions. So stay tuned. Excellent. Um how do LinkedIn and Instagram tie into the larger SEO story? Okay, so SEO is primarily Google. That's something you have to understand. So uh, I think like, so 90% of legal searches happen on, so, so when someone's looking for a legal services, it happens on Google first. So you have to understand majority of it is Google. And Instagram, from an SEO perspective, according to the algorithm, is non-existent. It's just another way to capture audience from a different platform. So some people may use LinkedIn, some people may use Instagram. It's just to reach different audiences on that platform. So that's the thing you have to understand. And LinkedIn is, so if I had to give a number for importance, I would say Google is 90%. 90 YouTube is 5%, LinkedIn is 3%, and Instagram, others is like 1%, 1%, stuff like that. So into the larger SEO story, it's a small fraction. So I would focus primarily on optimizing your content for Google, which I will discuss pertaining to the first question. Uh, and sorry, um, for the person who started a new law firm, uh, should you pay for SEO it completely uh, I want to say it depends. Uh, if you're consistently putting out content, so that's step number one. It's to consistently put out content. If you're not consistently putting out content and you're the one that's writing the content, paying for SEO is not just going to generate you new leads. You need to have like an existing content structure and marketing in place and SEO will help you boost it. It's not, so it's like, I, I think SEO is like fitness. So you can go to the gym, you can work out, but if you don't eat right, it's not going to work out. So yeah, so make sure you put out content consistently first, then you can worry about paying for SEO. Right. Um, is there a thumb rule on how to decide a content marketing budget? Uh, unfortunately, I do not have enough information to work with. So if you are a mid-sized firm with like, a three, four percent BD team, I would say, so that's already investing into the content marketing budgets because you're paying for the BD team to put out content. Um, in terms of fixed budget, uh, no, not really, because getting a, let's say you want, so when you mean budget, I'm thinking you want to outsource this to someone to write articles. So a good SEO writer will charge uh, I'm not sure about Indian prices. Sorry about that. Like, so when I work with content writers, they charge anywhere between like 200 to $400 for one really good article. So if you have the budget for that, sure. But otherwise try to do it in house. So if you have like something more specific regarding content marketing budget, I can answer that. But at the moment, that's the answer I have for you. No, it's a good answer. I think, uh, you know, it's it's good to get an understanding of what uh, trends are, uh, you know, running in, uh, you know, outside India, because I think we are still warming up to um, having content writers outsourcing content writing in the first place. And also, um, it's important to note that, uh, you know, good content writers um, you need, I think firms need to understand that it's sort of an investment. It's not something that, um, you know, that's going to give you instant results. There's nothing instant, right? So it's it's not going to give you instant results. So if you're investing in a good content writer, I think it has uh, long-term benefits and one needs to draw out uh, a legal budget based on that. 
Um, so it's it's important to keep in mind that the legal budget uh, factors in everything. Like Koshik said, uh, your internal costing, your external costing. I'm I'm gonna uh, you know just take in one more question because it's pertinent to this. Um, Samira has asked that does it help to drive traffic by doing a paid listing on legal publications like Chambers and Legal 500? Any tips on that? All right, so uh, that's a great question. I think that's something law firms. Um, so personally, uh, like I said, I deal with small and mid-sized law firms and legal publications uh, don't do, can I say shit? They don't do shit. Okay, I'm gonna say it. Uh, but from, oh, but if you're a big firm, uh, legal publications do matter because uh, let's say an American firm wants to partner or work with an Indian firm for an issue that's happening there. The first thing, two things they do. So they ask their network if they know any Indian firms that they trust. The second thing is they go and check them out on the legal 500 and chambers listings because they're trusted pages. So in time, in terms of driving, oh, you got 10,000 extra visitors from legal chambers. No, it does not work that way. It's not a, it's more of a verification kind of platform saying, okay, they are legitimate and they are trusted by the chambers and legal 500. So it's good that way. But besides that, in terms of getting traffic, no. And one other thing I've realized with legal listing, it's, it's good for when you do client decks or like client pitches saying, hey, look, we're, it's more from a credibility standpoint rather than a driving traffic standpoint. So if, if you work in the space where you work with a lot of international clients, I would definitely recommend uh, investing in the legal 500 or a chambers listing. Um, if not, save your money, put it in a, put it in your content marketing budget. Good point. So I think, I think for, for, a, uh, for the Indian law firm context, I think it's very pertinent to understand that the budget will probably entail all of this, right? Because, um, uh, I think even when it comes to, like you said, Kashik reference, right? Uh, from what, in our experience, what you've seen is that it matters for small and mid-sized firms as well, because if they are getting recognized, um, it's a small pool, right? When you look at the larger global sort of um, view, um, you know that there are only a handful of law firms that will, um, there's only so much space on legal 500 and chambers, right? And so it's it's good to good to do those, but I think it's equally important to sort of uh, you know um, rely on something that you can generate in house, which is your content. So uh, while the listings are um, a great way of um, hoping that um, you know someone will actually look at the listing and come to you. Um, like Koshik said, I think for pitches, um, they make a lot of sense because I, I think uh, a lot of times now the, the request for proposal that comes from the client side um, asks law firms to um, key in details of um, whatever accolades they have and if they've made it to the league tables or, you know, all the accomplishments on the on the publications as well. I think that's that's pertinent. But like Koshik said, I think it's important to rely on what you can do and generate at your end, which is content. So yeah. And I'm gonna go. Oh, sorry, it's echoing. Oh, I'm gonna go one step further and say that uh, if so, I was worked as a BD, uh, like a digital marketing manager at a IP firm, and I constantly got pitched to be featured like for the firm to be feature, uh, featured in magazines uh do not do it please uh for the love of god do not do it uh because one thing uh, i'm a firm believer is tracking how you can, so data is a big thing because that's why i'm in the digital space because everything is kind of instant right so i can let's say i go to my website i can see how many people came from where and what it, what actions did they take on the website and did it generate, did it turn into something meaningful? Did they contact me? Did they comment on my post? Or did they sign up to the newsletter? But when it comes to like magazines, so you, so I know firms paying like thousands of dollars to get it listed on a magazine and you have no data. Like, unfortunately, that's, a, that's something they have to take into factor because the magazine will say, hey, look, we have X amount of active readers or subscribers every month, but 
what do those subscribers mean? Do they just buy the book? Did they forget about their subscription and they just keep getting charged every month? Or is it turning into something meaningful? So yeah, uh, just wanted to take that extra step to say, don't do magazines. Why don't you, why don't you now take us through uh, what you were going to take us through on the Google SEO site? All right, so I want to talk more, a bit more about ROI because I think someone in the call could be, okay, I've stayed here for 50 minutes. So I put an X amount of dollars in, so what's my ROI? And I'll share my screen to show that talking about ROI just from a dollar, like not rupees, I guess. So from a, a financial perspective, uh, doesn't make sense. And it's honestly, I, I don't want to say shallow in terms of person, but from a strategy perspective, it's too shallow and it's not detailed enough to see what results you are getting from it. So let me quickly share my screen and I'll do a whiteboard. So one thing. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So one thing firms have to realize when it comes to ROI is that it so it has multiple stages. It's a sales cycle. So, and one thing I preach is your website is a sales funnel and it's not a billboard. It's not a place where you just put in information and you're like, all right, I'm done. People can look at my website and yep, I paid this much money for it. I'm not going to look at it again. That's a wrong way to look at your website because your website is like a lead generation machine. <laughs> so look at it like a sales funnel, right? So you have, sorry, I skipped art in school. All right. So you look at it. Okay. This is really bad. All right. From uh, like, let's, let's take a funnel here. And the first step is, awareness and this stage is where so so when you're investing in content marketing you have to realize that the goal of this stage is to get your content to as many readers as you can possibly so in the marketing terms it's called impressions because these are people who don't know anything about your firm so they know that they have a legal need and they're in the market for, they're shopping around for a legal, like for a lawyer, but they don't know that what you do. They don't know what you have to offer. They don't know how you've helped other clients or if you're actually good, do you communicate properly? Are you empathetic? Do you understand my problem? So your entire goal at the first stage is to create awareness and the end, oh shit, okay, where's the pointer? Uh, so the end result here is, impressions so for this stage your roi should be measured in impressions so the entire sales funnel can be okay it's not money in money out you have to break it down into smaller stages and you know take it from there so first step get your content to as many people as possible that's the first step in brand awareness second step is called engagement oh shit so, and the goal of engagement is so now that people are aware of what you do and what you have to offer, the next step is to get them to like your Facebook page, follow your LinkedIn page, or sign up to your newsletter. And the goal over here is, I call it engagement stage, but that's also the end results is to get for them to like your content. Like I said, familiarity breeds awareness. <laughs> I think someone pointed out in the chat as well. Uh, and your goal is for so you provide valuable content so that they like engage i know like likes and engagement on like facebook posts it's considered a vanity metric which i agree to some extent but it's also an important metric as part of the sales cycle so the goal here is for you to produce valuable content and uh so this is the goal for this stage for stage number two and stage number three is consideration this is when so you've nurtured them so they've been following your content for six to eight months i know for some people it may seem like a long time but it's uh in content marketing it's common so this is the stage where they're actually considering 
you know, contacting you for their legal service, legal needs. So the factors that really go into play here are uh, social proof. So do you have good testimonials? Do you have good reviews? How's your communication? Are you a good lawyer or you know, I've had like mixed reviews. And so people look at your social proof. They look at your practice area pages and anything and lawyer profiles. So this is why it's really important to have these three optimized, not just for SEO, but also from like a sales perspective, because like, let's say, even if I'm buying a product on like Amazon, something so simple, I look at, like the testimony, like the reviews, right? It's if some of them say, hey, this is bad and these are the problems that I experienced, it's right. very important to take them. So yeah, this is how you measure ROI for your content marketing strategy. It's not money in, money out. It's you break them down into individual steps in the sales funnel and you tackle each stage. So it's imp it's, so I'm not saying one step is important than the other, all three are equally important and you have to produce content for all three. So here it could be broader target. So let's say you're a, I keep using personal injury as an example here, but so let's say 10 things to do after a workplace accident. So that's a pretty broad topic and people could be searching for that. So that will give a lot of impressions and that's the goal of this stage. The next one is, you know what, so once they sign up to your newsletter, you know what questions, commonly asked questions you get from your clients. So answer those questions, make a content, uh, like make produce content out of it. So it feels like the person signed up in your newsletter, know that you're talking one-on-one -on -one with them and you, they feel like, okay, they know what problems exist for me. They've answered those questions. So that's, that goes along with personalization and creating engaging content. The well, last one is, you know, these. You need to have stellar testimonials, reviews. You can put your acquisitions. You're in the legal 500. You got XYZ awards, so that's great. So this is a great step for calculating ROI for content marketing. And yeah, so is there any questions uh, people have here? Because I know this could be like contradictory, conflicting and I'm open to answering questions here. I think that was, that was very interesting. Um, and, and you would agree, Koshik, that to do all of this, I think one, one point that's extremely important is con being consistent. So uh, you have to consistently uh, have the intent very clear and put out um, you know, content that, that, like you said, resonates with people. Uh, people want to do something with that content. They want to read it, they want to consume it, they want to ask you more. That's the kind of cycle that you want to get into. Mm -hmm. um, any, any questions from the audience? Uh, now is a good time to ask those questions. And um, so, Kaushik, while while uh, the audience is thinking of questions, um, could you could you share uh, the you know in terms of I know you're not fond of the of the, of the term, but what, what kind of content forms part of the thought leadership pieces for lawyers? Because I think that's, that seems to be one of um, the thing that we, things that we hear very regularly uh, lawyers talk about or firms talk about. Um, okay, so uh, I'll talk about what makes someone a thought leader and I'll take things from there. So I think, I think the primary fundamental underlying reasons for putting content is because Law firms are often seen as faceless. Uh, I want to explain it here. I think uh, I post that in my content too. Because so when someone interacts with a person, so they know it's a person with feelings, so they could share same values, principles. So people buy services from people. It's not businesses buying from businesses or people buying from businesses. People do business with people they know. That's the fundamentals behind every human interaction. So they want, that's why I talk about personalized connection because they know it's a person talking to another person. And law firms are often seen as faceless because all 
they do is write articles, repost it on LinkedIn without any personalization. So there's no person element involved in it. So what I insist on law, lawyers in law firms or BD managers in law firms doing is start working on your personal brand because that's how you develop thought leadership. And once again, as someone pointed out, it is time consuming, but it is worth it. And like, once again, I'm living proof of it because you're on the call over here and that's how it happened. So choose one platform where your audience are. And I'm going to say, since most of the people are in the legal industry, choose LinkedIn. Uh, posting content initially is really intimidating. I'm going to say that. So I would, so literally I would like be in the, you know, when you post a piece of on LinkedIn, it's like a draft mode. I would literally stay there for like 40 minutes. I would be like super anxious. I was like, oh my God, what are people going to think of me? Are there any grammatical mistakes? Oh my God, I don't want to offend anyone. Those are, it's okay to have those legitimate fears. It's, it's part of being human, right? So, and people want to see that uh, because people are so, I, I think the average attention span in modern world is seven seconds. They're so used to being bombarded by ads, media notifications, and there's like constant dopamine hits that people want like good personalized content. It's just that simple. So how do you establish yourself as a thought leader? It's just you start posting content and you don't establish yourself as a thought leader. People establish you as a thought leader. So that's how it works. So post content consistently and people will know, okay, this person knows what he's talking about. So if a content is good, so people will comment on your post and they'll have their two cents and you can start a conversation and build relationships. So at the end of the day, it's about building person to person relationships. And that's how you get established as a thought leader. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think some people were expecting like a more like a di different answer, but I think, start working on your personal brand and you will automatically eventually in like two, three years, you'll be established as a thought leader. Right. Um, also, why are hashtags important? Are they important? And if they are, then why are they important? Okay. So once again, LinkedIn, right? So when you post something on LinkedIn, the algorithm is smart enough to go through your content and see, okay, this post, is about, uh, I'm gonna use one of my posts as an example. So it talks about social media. So it's smart enough to like skim through it and know what he's talking about. But if you're talking about multiple things, so let's say you're talking about social media, you're talking about content writing for social media, that's when the algorithm gets confused and it could show it to the wrong audience. So hashtags are important because it gives direction to your content. So let's say you're talking about lawyers, social media, and content marketing. So if you just use a content marketing hashtag, it's going to show it to all content marketing people. So they could be content marketing people working in e-commerce. They could be content marketing working in finance, banking, and I don't know, like biology. Like I'm just making stuff up right here. So if you don't give direction to who your content should be shown to, it's at the end of the day, it's like you're putting in all this effort, but if you don't do hashtags, it's like not giving it direction. And I think one good thing when it comes to hashtag is uh, LinkedIn prefers it if you have anywhere between three to five hashtags. Anything over, it considers it spammy or it considers the like you're targeting too narrow. So it needs enough people so that it can go to, okay go to this hashtag, go to this hashtag, go to this hashtag. So you should use hashtags that your content is talking about. So if you use generic hashtag, it's great. So you can use hashtag lawyers because you're a lawyer. Uh, I do that because I want to get my content shown to lawyers. But at the same time, you have to have like a specific hashtag relating to that piece of post so that it can be, it can know, it can target it properly. So to answer your questions, uh, yes, hashtags are important. It gives direction to your content. 
Um, we have one question. It says, how do I differentiate myself from other corporate lawyers? Because he is not a differentiator for sure. But uh, we're all doing great work and then accolades. That's okay. The uh, you have to start building your personal brand uh, because all lawyers, they're getting awards. They're doing great work. They're working with top businesses, top law firms. So you are like a regular fish in a regular pond. So if you want to separate yourself, and I'm sure that they're not putting in that extra effort to write posts, to give their knowledge, to give their two cents for free and network with like other lawyers. And if you do that, you will definitely set yourself apart. So I think that's the simple answer I can give you here. Excellent. Um, and, and, uh, and invest in SEO because uh, not a lot of law firms, Indian law firms are doing it. They're slowly starting to do it. So if you're a corporate lawyer, invest in your personal brand, invest in SEO, within a year or two, you'll be miles ahead. Um, to, uh, if we don't have more questions, we'll probably end the session, but let's end it on a fun fact. So um, Kaushik, would you like to share some of the popular hashtags uh, that, that lawyers use and actually see? Uh, okay, catch? I think one of the great thing is Hashtag law firms, with this is plural. Uh, it's a great way because um, I don't know. It's just like I, I, I say that law firms are often seen as faceless, right? But that hashtag does a really good job of putting a personality behind a law firm, even though it's a business. So I would definitely recommend using that. And hashtag lawyers. Uh, so uh, one thing I want to talk about when you're building your personal brand is people want to know more about your life. So it's not just, oh, I got nominated to speak in this event, or I got nominated for this award. Sure, it's, a, it's great that you're doing great in your you know, lawyer life, but people also want to know about what you're doing personally. So that's some, I think there's a stigma around lawyers sharing their personal life because they won't be seen as professional. So they want, you know, something, but people want to know what you're up to in real life. So let's say you spend the weekend with your kids, just make a simple post about it. So people want to know more about your life. So hashtag, so check out hashtag lawyers on LinkedIn. You'll see like a lot of lawyers talking about going dirt biking over the weekend. They love spending time with their kids. They like, they like jazz. So they're at a jazz bar getting drunk. So, I mean, you don't have to get drunk and post that, but you could share your social life. That's what I'm trying to say. So, valid point. I think we have a couple of more questions. Sure. Um, can you share one case study from your clients? Is is uh, sure. Uh, is it pertaining to? I'm I'm gonna assume it's for SEO. Yeah, yeah. All Content right. marketing, SEO. Anything that that where you saw that uh, there was resistance, then you saw that you know you were able to they were able to overcome that resistance, and then you know. How okay. they yeah. All right. So when I uh, go work with law firms, so their first thing is why does SEO cost so much? And I understand that. So I start them with something lower. So I do paid ads and I show them results. Hey, look, digital marketing strategies work. So they're so used to, some of them are pretty old school and they're like, Hey, we ran billboard ads or we like TV ads. So the first step is, uh, from a personal standpoint, the first resistance I got was I'm investing so much money. I've been, you know, I don't, I don't want to say scammed, but like I've worked with like three marketing agencies before. They didn't produce any results. What makes you any different? Oh, that's a genuine question. And you've been burned. I feel your pain, but that's why I start slow. So I show them results with like paid ads. They see the results. So they're like, Hey, let's do SEO. Then we move there. So one thing that I saw from like to put out numbers is I started working with this Australian law firm uh, around four months ago. And I say SEO is a long-term game, right? So we've increased. So they were getting around, uh, they were mid-sized firms. So they were getting around 3,500 people to their website every month. So within four months, they're around 9,000 people now. So if you were to pay with paid ads, that's like five, $6,000. So 
instead we get like consistent people uh so we get people consistently organically through seo so i bet the person asking the question is wondering so what did that result in so we got two clients they were one was worth uh i can't give you names unfortunately but one was worth eleven thousand dollars other one was worth fourteen thousand dollars so their cases it was a personal injury firm it was like a workplace accident so their ROI was pretty good. Uh, so they kind of like doubled their money after working with us, I guess. So yes, you could definitely generate clients in the short term, but one, consistent clients would like take long term. So uh, to give you some like ballpark numbers. So if, so someone said, I'm a new firm and I'm starting out. So you'll start seeing results for SEO and after the one year mark, because you need to establish your authority with Google. So unfortunately, that's how the algorithm works. Uh, after one year, you'll start seeing results. Ideally, between 18 and 24 months is when you'll start seeing really good results. And uh, if you're an established firm, you're, you've been in business for three to five years, you've posted content before, but you really didn't optimize that much. Once you start optimizing for SEO, you should st start seeing results in like the six to eight month mark. So that's the uh, giving like numbers to help them understand better. Understood. Oh. Um, we've got one more which asks, what is your opinion on law firm hiring co-strikers? You should absolutely do it. I can recommend you some. Uh, I work with a few Indian writers. They are brilliant. They're law firm students. Uh, they do some really good work. I was impressed with them. So feel free to reach out if you want me to put you in touch with them. Uh, they're students, so they're affordable. <laughs> I think that's a way to put it. And they do some really good work. So they understand how SEO works, how your readers view content. And you should definitely do that. Uh, but uh, if you're going to go out of your way to like, if you know someone who's hired one before, I think it's better to go through referrals. Otherwise, if you like go online, it's a matter of trial and error because your writing style or your personality may not suit the ghostwriter and you don't want to get out. So let's say the ghostwriter writes really good content and people turn into a client and the, the client experience is not what they expected out of your content. So it's a matter of trial and error and please be careful with that. Correct. Uh, we've got one more request saying, please recommend them. So maybe Kaushik, you, uh, you can um, uh, share some of the recommendations with us and we can pass them on to oh, Kaushik sure. to ask the question. Okay, um, uh, I can definitely do that. Oh. Yep. Uh, we've got the TGM team has a bunch of writers as well. We've got, uh, I mean, we, it, it's, they're not a part of the team, but we have worked with them. We've recommend them to, uh, recommended them to some of the firm. So yes, there is a growing, and also I think a lot of students who are now law students who are actually learning um, how to uh, write content um, that's SEO compliant. So uh, there are those students as well. I think um, the huge, huge uh, rise in the number of uh, students who are actually taking on uh, freelance assignments like these. Um, and they're out there and we'd be very happy to recommend them to uh, to you all. Uh, Koshik can send in his recommendations as well. Uh, sorry, uh, how are we on time? I just forgot that uh, I wanted to go over like a pretty important, like how to optimize your content for SEO. I think some could be interested. Are we good on time? Or can I do that? Yeah, yeah, yes. All right, I'll share my screen and all right. So the first, all right, oh, sorry, I want to talk about it before. So the first step that goes when you're putting, so what I'll tell you what, how law firms currently put out content. So the partners, they write a piece of article. It's sometimes very legal. It gets passed on to the B team the marketing team so they have to make it a bit more readable a little less lawyery and they edit it and publish it so you don't know if and at the end of it the lawyers in the law firm overall hope that people find the content valuable and they'll read it i think that's the wrong approach to take because you don't know if a particular topic has if you only have to put content if people are searching for a particular content. 
If not, you wasted your own time. If you're a lawyer, you wasted the BD team's time. So overall, you wasted around 20 hours, um, so which could be spent on other good marketing activities. So what I want to recommend today is figuring out if people are searching a particular topic, then deciding if you should write that top, write articles for that topic or not. So uh, I will share my screen and I think people might have heard of keyword research. Uh, so basically keywords are what people type into Google and it could be oh litigation firms and stuff like that. So I will take uh, the example. So, if you are, in, if you only operate in India, I would yeah. give you that example. I think that'll be better. Okay. So, I use a tool called Keyword Key Search. Uh, it's pretty good. Um, it's it's affordable. It's seventeen dollars a month, which is I would consider that really cheap. And I abuse the system. Uh, for, <laughs> it's actually really good for the money. And so, yeah, um, let me take you in a bit more into how I structure content. Um, so let's say you're in commercial litigation or let me take a better example, intellectual property. Or if anyone has like a particular industry they want keyword research, please let me know in chat and I can do it. You'll make my job easier and I can give you free research work. You don't have to pay for it. There you go, uh, participants. If you have, um, you know, any particular industry that you want uh, Kaushik to look for, I, now is a good time to put that in the chat box. All right, so I'll take I. So I don't think there is any. Nothing. Nothing. All right, all right. So I'll take IP as an example in that case. So uh, we've got we've got one request from Anupam. I think he said data privacy. Okay. Cool. So I'll show you how like uh, keyword research goes. So first step, step one, keyword research. That's how you figure out if there's interest. So this I'm searching only for India. Uh, if you operate globally, uh, you could go for that as well. But this is just data from India. So this is basically volume. It says how many people are searching this particular keyword every month. So 3,000, uh, I think the numbers are a bit botched. It's way more than that. So 3,600, it's just like a reference. So. Okay. There's enough search volume, I mean. So 3,600 people are searching about particular topics related to data privacy. Or if you want data privacy laws or protection policies, there's only 210, but it's realistically more like 1,000 people. And Key Search assigns you scores. So if a score is like this, it means it's pretty difficult to rank for it because the other people, other top search results are pretty good. So I would go for something a bit lower score. So 39 is green. So that means it's a lower score. So I would definitely try to, if you, so let's say you're a law firm and you want to talk about various data protection policies. And you're, so this is, I would interpret this as, it's around five times around, it's around thousand people searching data protection policy in India. And current, let's say you're currently only getting 2,000 people to your website, and let's say you rank top three, it's an extra 300, 400 people coming to your website organically. So that's, so let's say you wanna write, you're figuring out you're in the data privacy industry, you're like, hey, what do I write about? Uh, do I write about GDPR policy? Um, no, not really, it's super difficult to rank for, so I cannot get like traffic, I cannot get a lot of eyeballs on my article. Let's see something else. So you deal with Google account privacy. So let's check the score. And if it's easy, write about it. If it's difficult, don't write. Oh, so it's super difficult because the top ranking articles are Google. So you don't want to go for that. So similarly, like just look at the search volume, check the scores. If it's green, write about it. That means the chance of that article ranking high on Google is pretty high so that you can actually get organic visitors to your website. 
So that's step number one. Step number, actually, can I show you like a bit on the behind the scenes on how to structure content? Absolutely. Okay, I will go to my, all right, let me log in. So let me stop sharing real quick, one second. Sure. I, I will log in and get back. All right, so let me share again. Uh, so this is like the back end of my website. So I currently have 13 articles, right? So it says over here, I use WordPress. Mm. And I wanna show you what a good article looks like. So I know this is not pertaining to like a particular law because, well, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a legal marketing agency. So uh, it's just to show how the framework works. So when, when it comes to optimizing your content for SEO, there's multiple elements. One is the header. So this is probably the most important element that you need to target and make sure that the keyword you're targeting has to be on the header. This is what we call H1 as in header one, which is the title of the article. So let's say you're talking about data protection policy in India, your title should be data protection policy in India, a complete guide or something like that. So the keyword has to be in the title. And I would recommend using an add-on called RankMath. It's completely free. So it gives you an idea of how this particular, key, so let's say I'm targeting social media for lawyers here, and it has these various metrics. It will tell you if you're doing good or bad. So I think one more thing law firms need to do is like have smaller paragraphs because law firms just have like one giant paragraph and it's so cluttered and difficult to read and it's not great for SEO. So divide it into smaller sections. So in header two, it's once again, so if you look at the keyword I'm targeting, it's social media for lawyers, right? Mm -hmm. So I have it in my title. I have it in my subheadings and I ha also have it in my third subheading, which is header three. So Google knows that, okay, when Kaushik is writing this article, it's about social media for lawyers. Mm -hmm. So structure your contents, write smaller paragraphs, include images, because you need to, if it's too monotonous, people will get bored and they don't want to read, they just leave the article. So okay. if you look at my actual, like let's preview the article. So if you look at it, I have a good image. So once again, this is really good for publishing on social media because I already have an image. I have a good title. So I'm optimizing, I'm keeping my end goal as optimization. And I wanna do as little work as possible after I'm done writing this article. So I don't wanna do the same thing on LinkedIn all over again. So it's already optimized. So if you look at it, I have like a table of content. I have like proper headings with like the keywords. I have like images, it breaks the monotony. And yeah, overall, I would give this article like an eight out of 10 because there's images, there's various things going on. And yeah, so, and this article is around like 2,500 words, if you, if you look at it here. So Google ideal first page articles around 2,000 words. So that's why I'm a huge proponent of not doing legal updates because legal updates are 500 words and it's not really good for ranking on Google for SEO. So that's why I tell people to keep it to the newsletter where it's like more targeted and people want to know information. So for SEO and Google, uh, write longer articles, which are more on broad topics. Okay. That's extremely helpful. Uh, I, I, I know this is like a lot to take in, but uh, so, you want, so this is like going behind the scenes on, let's say, I told you about the Australian firm I did SEO for, right? Okay. Okay. So what I would do is, I, so I did an article on 10 things to do after a workplace accident because workplace accident was the keyword. So I would put it in the header. I would write subsections. I would have like proper images. I would have like Q and A. So that, that it's very enticing and people get a lot of value when I read from it. So when people read legal updates, you don't really get that value because not all the questions are answers, answered. It leaves more room for questions. So I think take a legal update, 
give your two cents, add your opinions and comments, answer questions, include quotes from like people in the industry and what they think of it to make it more enticing. Because if they wanted changes in the law, I think they could just go to the legal handbook and there's changes there, right? They can look at it. So they are coming to you because they want your opinion. So I think this is like one of the behind the scenes on how to write an article. Excellent. This was this was very, very helpful because I think um, we don't realize internally, especially at firms, I think um, it's important to first research as to what is doing well, what is not, uh, what will work, what will fly, and then get into the writing part. I think this is very, very helpful. Uh, so thank you for sharing that, um, Kaushik. Any other questions that our participants have? Um, that uh, you want to ask Koshik? Uh, and if, yeah, please it, go ahead. It, it, it could be uh, uh, anything. So if you're thinking about cost, uh, so if you're, let's say you're thinking about investing in SEO and you're worried if it's not going to fit your budget, so please ask questions. I can give you numbers. I don't know if you, from like listening to me, I love talking numbers. I love statistics. I love data. So yeah, if you want like, hey, look, what is SEO going to cost me? Or how much should my, like someone asked about budget. So if you have more specific questions, I can answer them for you. And if you have questions regarding ROI, if you're worried about how to choose the right agency, I can answer it. Okay, actually choosing about the right agency. I think I can answer them myself. I don't need a question. So if you've thought about investing in SEO or like a digital marketing agency for copy content writing, one thing, I think you have to look at one thing and one thing only primarily is communication. I think one of the biggest problems with my industry is that it's not a lack of proper communication. So let's say you want an article written. And I think I've noticed this with a lot of Indian firms too. So they want the piece of article written. They're like, hey, look, we publish articles every Friday and I want this by Friday so that can be up three days, no communication at all. You're like, okay, I'm paying for something. So make sure that they have excellent communication. If the communication is not great at the start, it's not gonna be great later. So that's absolute step number one. Step number two is like the standard. Look at like uh, testimonials, like social proof. Look, look at other work that they've done. Look at case studies. Uh, and yeah, uh, make an educated decision. Sometimes it could be a bit expensive, but it will be worth it because uh, oftentimes I've seen law firms going for the cheaper option because it's, well, it suits their budget, but uh, at the same time, the quality of the work may not be there and the com it will often feel like you're going behind them for updates rather than them saying, hey, look, X, Y, Z happened and are you ready for the next article or something? So yeah, it's just like something you have to be aware of. Excellent point. So, um, any any questions there in terms of costing? Would you like to just anyway give us, a, say for instance, we were talking about a firm that has, let's say, two partners, and they have an associate pool of about 10 people. Uh, what do you think their SEO budget should be? And they are very, let's say they're very niche players. They're only in... Um, for instance, let's choose um, capital markets, or let's choose tax or shipping. You know, if they are in that in that uh, sort of practice, uh, sorry. only. Sorry, you could you think, could you repeat uh, that? I, could you repeat that? I lost you there for a second. Your voice got yes, cut off. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, if if we were looking at firm, a small firm, two partners, about eight to 10 associate, uh, associates, and um, they were in some very niche practice areas. Mm -hmm. So if, for instance, they were not so much into M&A and private equity because, you know, we have that pool everywhere. Why, why don't we look at, say, intellectual property or capital markets mm -hmm. um, and maybe tax or shipping? What do you think their budget should be for, um, you know, SEO? Okay. Uh, I know in USD, let me convert it to sure. rupees. Oh, I am an Indian citizen, sorry, but I hand, handle primarily in US dollars. So give me a second. No <laughs> For SEO, I would say around, um, 
SEO is a bit more expensive. So uh, let me start with content writers. So mm -hmm. I think in India, you can get really good content writers for uh, 30, 35,000 rupees per month. Uh, so, so that is, I think it'll save you like a whole lot of time and money in the long run because you don't have to worry about headaches, about communication. So, and you can get out articles consistently. So anywhere from 30 to 40 is a really good start. Um, SEO is going to be way more expensive. Uh, you can get like, so I've seen like a few SEO agencies in India. So they charge like 30, 35,000 rupees, but their quality is just not there. Um, so I would definitely go for something above 80, 80,000. It, it's, a, it's a lot of money. I, I get that, but I would definitely do that. Uh, because you, like SEO, like content marketing, you can, it's, it's a matter of trial and error, but mm -hmm. SEO, you cannot do that because let's say you've been paying them for like three months and you can't trial every three months, right? Because you've already invested, let's say you put like a, one lakh rupee in uh, SEO, you cannot have that every three months. You cannot cycle that. So it's very important for you to choose an SEO agency uh, that way. So go for the bit more expensive side, even though it's, it's at the end of your comfort zone and content. Uh, you can get really good content for like 30, 35,000. So you can actually like hire them full time. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. Okay, excellent. We've got a question from Anubam. Um, can you recommend online tools, free or paid, that one can use apart from the ones mentioned for SEO purposes? Okay, uh, for, okay, content is, so I like, uh, so the free ones are, can I type it out here so that the chat yes, can? Yes, yes, on so the chat itself. Yeah. One it. is Google Keyword Planner. Uh, so wait, can you recommend online tools for anything that we can use? Mentioned for SEO purposes exclusively. Okay, Google Keyword Planner is a great starter tool. Um, uh, but I, I don't know, I, I like Key Search better. Basically it's Key Search but mm -hmm. if you just want something free and you want a ballpark, because Key Search gave you like specific numbers, right? In terms of search volume, Google Keyword Planner does not do that. It'll say, so let's say for data privacy, it was 3,600 people. Google mm -hmm. Keyword Planner will say, oh, it was between 1,000 and 10,000 people. So you don't know if it's on the lower end or upper end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to charge. So not the greatest, uh, but I'm just gonna put it there. And the, uh, the tool that I used was Key Search. I yeah. highly recommend that. It's uh, also put the cost, uh, $17 per month. And oh, full transparency, I do have an affiliate link. So if you're thinking of purchasing it, I can share it with you. Uh, another thing is called AREF, which is paid and it's a bit more on the expensive side. But if you're thinking of really going into content marketing and SEO, absolutely worth it that's the number one tool i recommend i think it's around um, 150 dollars as a starter and it goes all the way to like 197 dollars if you want to add multiple people in so you can get the agency plan it's cheaper and uh free tools so this is for seo and keyword research uh well let me categorize it as well uh Oh, sorry, I put it in the host and panelists. Let me share it in everyone. That's what the team can share it in with the... All right, so that is for keyword research and uh, for content tools, mm -hmm. I like a thing called answer the public. So it's basically people that are asking questions on Google, but it's all compiled in like one, it's like, it's, it's on it's on various categories so definitely check that out i use that personally for writing content as well so that gets a thumbs up um i think this is a good start uh for yeah, tools yeah, it is it is absolutely a good start thank you for sharing that um this is super helpful i think um anything that that the audience wants to say ask um we can spend a couple of minutes just answering that and if not, uh, like Kaushik said, I think um, extremely important to focus uh, on the fact that content marketing is an investment and it's a long-term play. Um, so uh, 
if you can look at it from that that point of view it will be easier to embrace a lot of the aspects which is cost which is time uh, a lot of that has to be uh, put in to make sure that you're playing a game that's that's long drawn um, and fruitful and i uh, just want to add that so uh, one minute someone said that they're a corporate lawyer and i want to stand out this is putting out content is absolutely how you stand out because not a lot of people are doing that and I feel like I'm repeating the same points, but start it, start it. It's going to be a bit time consuming initially. You'll get used to it. You can, once you stay consistent, you'll start seeing the results because I was super hesitant to put out content. I was like, oh my God, it's like so time consuming. Like short term, I was like, oh, why am I not getting leads? I made like five posts in one month. But then uh, I, I think I came up with the wrong mindset and it, I'm going to be honest, it didn't work. It took me eight months to figure out what to post. So first I would, if you oh, actually, uh, can I share my LinkedIn here? Is that okay? Yes. yes All right. So feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn because, and you'll see my posts. Like if you go back eight months, you'll see like the quality wasn't there. It took me a lot of trial and error to figure out what's going on. And it's okay. It's okay to be not know what you're doing. It's okay to figure out when you when you it's a journey right it's not a destination okay. so now uh all of my leads are completely from linkedin and my blog so um so yeah content marketing definitely works i don't have to do any more outreach it's just it's so it's also the lead quality is higher if they're inbound because they've right. done their research they know what i have to offer mm -hmm. similarly yeah uh, it'll work for you as well excellent um, say this is helpful. Thank you so much, Kaushik. Very engaging and informative. Thank you. Thank you for taking your time on a Saturday and morning. I know some people like to sleep in. That's that's me. I like to sleep <laughs> in. So yeah. Uh, thank you for taking your time, and I hope this uh, session you found it insightful, or uh, inf insightful. And I hope I was able to change your mindset when it comes to content. Uh, hopefully, I pushed you in the right direction to start your personal branding. Um, and yeah, uh, eventually you will find success in content marketing. Well, all you have to do right now is start, stick to it, stay consistent. You'll see results. That's all I have to say. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kaushik, for, for spending time on a Saturday morning uh, doing this and taking every question very patiently and trying to cover as much ground as possible. Also giving them takeaways in terms of, you know, uh, the sites that they can use as free tools, big tools. Um, thank you for honestly sharing all of that. Um, and we look for the participants, we look forward to having you over tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, the ABC of Legal Tech, um, we've got someone from Manupatra, uh, we've got someone from Nexel uh, talking about CRM and relationship building and networking. And then we have someone from uh, you know, uh, Mike Legal, uh, where we talk about automation on um, just the very basics that lawyers do on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you, thank you very, very much for the session, Kaushik, and thank you. Uh, thank for you for having me. See you tomorrow. Yeah, thank you. Bye.